want to talk about something that's very important, which, which has to do with our growth in God. And, and the, the best way I can really um, illustrate this is I, I just recently, uh, my daughter Ariana, my youngest, has started taking karate. And um, taking karate is a very interesting thing. I remember when I took karate as a kid, I did it for a little while. I think I got to white belt, yellow stripe. You couldn't tell me nothing. I was just, I was, I was Bruce Lee in my own mind. But, but I remember it was, it was really good because it helped you teach you discipline and focus and things of that nature. And I remember it, I was taking her to class, and she's been in it now for a couple of months. And I said to her, I said, I really love what they're doing. I love the discipline they're teaching. I love the respect they're teaching. How many of our kids need to learn respect? Amen. The, 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 and everything else. I said, but the problem I have, the one problem I have is there's no homework. And she was like, homework? <sighs> You know, you got that sucking sound of air that just comes out of every teenager's mouth when you say homework. And, and I said, yeah, here's the thing. The thing about homework is if you practice outside of class, it'll help you by the time you get to class to be much better. And I'm like, you know, it makes no sense for us to be part of anything that we're going to do consistently if we're not going to improve. How many know that if you're going to do something regularly, you ought to do it in excellence? You see, you see, we ought not to be just struggling and straggling throughout life in every area of life. How many know that, if we, especially as King's kids, come on, we ought to be excellent. Tell your neighbor, you need to be excellent. You see, and here's the thing, and I said to her, I said, so we're going to create, so I went to the instructor, I said, what can we do for homework? And they said, well, you can Google some things and YouTube some videos. So she YouTubed some stuff and started practicing. And don't you know the next time she was in class, they had her in the front of the class teaching and showing how to do the moves. And I was like, that's my baby right there. That's my baby. And, and, and one of the things that I find is that no matter what you do, you're going to have to put forth some effort in it if you want to get better. You see, I don't know. I hope nobody told you that when you got saved, as soon as you got saved, you were just going to grow up in God if you just stayed in the right place at the right time. How many know you got to put forth some effort to grow? You, come on. How many know that growth is a choice? There's decisions that need to be made. And, and there are areas that I believe that are harder for us to grow in than others. And, and if we attack the hard areas, the easier areas tend to work out by themselves. Today, I want to talk more about this because I believe that too many times in, the, in our faith, we just go with the flow. We just, we just kind of go with the motions. And, and as a result, we live lives that if we were to be honest, we look at our lives and we know that we, we do things we ought not to do and we struggle, we wrestle. And some of us just say, you know what, I'm just not that deep. Some, some, I used to ask a trick question in membership class. If you hear me ask this question, I'm going to tell you right now, there is, there is no right answer. But I would ask the difference, what's the difference between a Christian and a disciple? And most people would say, well, a Christian is one who believes and a disciple who's one who's serious. And I'm like, is there any way you can be a Christian and not be serious about the things of God? Is there any way you can really be a follower of Christ? Jesus said, if anybody comes after me, he has to deny himself. He has to take up his cross. He has to die daily. How many know that there's only one way to serve God, and that's all in? And, and the reality is, I think too many times as Christians, we, we get to a point where we say, well, at least I'm not where I need to be. But thank God I'm not where I used to be. Anybody have that testimony? Now, now, understand, we acknowledge progress, but it's important for us to continue to grow in God. How I many know at some point we ought to mature and start to look like our parents? Come on, you get a kid that's 21 and look nothing like you, how I many know a lot of people are going to have a lot of questions? And as Christians, those of us, especially if we've been in the faith for weeks, months, you know, after a while, people should say, you ought to look a little more like your daddy and, not, and a lot less like everybody else. Come on, and so, and so that's what I want to talk about today is how can we grow in excellence? Tell your neighbor, you got to grow, you got to grow. I want to specifically read just a, a very bro, uh, small portion of Scripture for which we're going to really get the basis of what we're talking about. And I want to read that, uh, I want to read a section in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I want to read just verses 1 and 2. This is the New International Version. It reads like this. It says, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of each week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And if you would, why don't you turn to your neighbor and just tell them, neighbor, we need to live on the next level. Come on, turn to your other neighbor. Tell them, other neighbor, we need to live on the next level. Come on, let's take a minute and pray. Father, again, we just ask that you would speak prophetically to your people. Give insight, send the anointing that makes preaching easy. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. The, in order for us to live on the next level, in order for us to grow, we have to practice. Allen Iverson became famous for talking about practice. Anybody remember that? Practice. You're talking about practice, not the game. Practice. Even superstars have to practice. And, and for those of us who want to grow and become mature, it takes practice. You see, because it's in practice that we take action. Action is the only thing that produces results. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, as well as 1 Corinthians 16, if we look at what's taking place, Paul, and, and as historians tell us, Paul had encountered a situation. There was a famine that was taking place in Macedonia, and he went out to the other churches, and he told them about the famine that was taking place and how the church was impacted. There were people that were starving. There were people that were dying. There were people that were in, in terrible, terrible situations. And the great thing about the churches is the other churches, when they heard it, their hearts sprung into action. They said, we need to do something about it. We want to be a blessing. You see, I believe it's a demonstration that God has done a work in your heart when you want to be a blessing to somebody that's in need. How many know that when your heart starts to move, to, to take action, when God puts something on your heart, that's a demonstration that God is doing something in your heart. Amen? How many know that as a church, we ought to be compassionate people that are moved more so than the world? And so the great thing is that the church sprung up. In fact, in the Corinthian church, the, uh, the Scripture says you were the first ones that wanted to give. When you heard, you said, I want to do something about it. Like, you know, help. I want to be able to help. What can I do? Isn't it a great thing to have a heart to do the right thing? Isn't it a great thing to have a heart that's moved by the things of God? You see, so this was the situation of the church. But we find as we study that the church that said they wanted to be a blessing, when Paul said, okay, we're going to come and, and raise the money to be a blessing, everybody wasn't ready. In fact, Scripture tells us that Paul came about three times to collect one offering because people that said they wanted to do it wasn't ready when it was time. How many know that if you're fitting to do something for years, that's not going to get it done? Come on, we got to follow through to make some things happen. The reality is, if we were to be honest in our lives, there's lots of things that we would say, I know the right thing to do, I want to do the right thing, but I don't always do what I'm supposed to. Anybody want to be honest and admit there's some stuff I just don't do that I'm supposed to do? The, the challenge is this. We know that in life, <clears throat> many times it isn't a, a matter of knowledge. How many know the magic secret to losing weight? How many know the magic secret? Anybody know the magic secret? Amen. Is diet and exercise. Look at that. That's free right there. So you, can, you don't have to pay, pay for that, that special pill online, right? But we know the magic secret. The challenge is, is we don't know. The challenge is we love that carrot cake. Come on, we love them M&Ms. Come on, we love the Ben and Jerry's. Come on, I, 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 where am I, who am I talking to in here? We love that. Come on, we, you see, the problem is we have a decision to make when we sit down at that table, and, and, and many times that, carrot, that coconut cake starts to speak to you. I don't know about you, but coconut cake, I think, is, is God's food. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be eating coconut cake. Where are my saints at? You're going to heaven? Amen. You're going to make it in? Amen. You're going to make it in? There's some folks over here I'm not sure about. <laughs> But, but the reality is, we, we know what we're doing. The problem is, it's, it's, it's that discipline. It's the ability to say, I want to push that plate away in Jesus' name. It's, it's, it's the ability to say, listen, I'm going to do the right thing. And, and the reality is, just, just like that, how many know becoming spiritually strong in God, there's no mystery. How many know you got to read your Bible? You got to pray, Amen. Come on, y'all got to worship. Anybody, anybody understand? How many know there's some basic things you got to do in order to grow? And the reality is, it's not so much a lack of knowledge, but it's the fact that when it's time to pray and your favorite show comes on, that's when a decision has to be made. Come on, when the Bachelorette comes back on. Come on, where y'all at? Come on. Come on, when Greenleaf show on, where power shows up, where y'all at? Some of y'all in here know what I'm talking about. Y'all like, I don't know what he's talking about, but if I check your DVR, come on, it'll say you're lying. You, the, the, the key is when it comes time to do what's necessary, we have a decision to make. And a lot of times, this is where the discipline determines whether or not we're going to get stronger or not. Tell, tell your neighbor, you got to practice. you got to practice. You see, the, the thing we need to have is a plan. You see, plans help us, plans protect us from when life happens. Because how many know life is going to happen? 
Amen. If you, it, it, it never amazes me. You know, I used to teach finances before becoming a pastor. I would do workshops, and I would say, you got to build a budget, and you got to make sure, you know, everything's in place. And I have a lot of times people would push back. It's like, budget, like you said a bad word. Somebody, when you hear budget, it's like a, it's like a cuss word. They're like, ugh. You know, and I would say, listen, but a, a budget frees you because a budget prepares you. Because I would say, listen, you, you know, if you drive a car, right, long enough, something's going to happen. You got to put gas in the car, right? You got to put some tires on the car. And, it, and it, really, it really amazes me when people say, oh, man, I had this unexpected expense. It just blew my whole budget. That's why I don't even have a budget. But how many know you should plan on your t- replacing your tires? Because you know what's going to happen. Eventually, if you don't replace your tires, you're going to see steel, amen, sparks are going to fly, and you're going to end up on the side of the road. Don't, don't tell me if that's your testimony. But I just need you to understand that we need to have a plan to see what's happening in advance. You see, the, the, the challenge that we have is that if we don't plan to grow, growth is not going to happen by itself. You can't just sit in the presence of God and expect God to get a hold of your life and do all of the work. God is saying, listen, you got to have some godly character. you got to develop some habits. How many know the Bible says that we should be, have our minds renewed? He said, you know, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, amen, and, and understand this, there's work that we have to do to get our mind renewed. It doesn't happen on automatic. The fact is, the world is programming us to do everything the world wants us to do, and if we're going to do what God wants us to do, we got to change the program. You see, I, I told you years ago, when I first got saved, one of the most difficult things I had to do was, was deal with the music I was listening to, because I always, I love music. I mean, I jazz, I mean, and when I got saved back in the day, it was that old school R&B, hip hop, come on, that, 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 that music that, that, that kind of gets you going, you know, when you, when you hear the beat drop, the first beat, you knew the whole song, and you start singing the whole song. Any, anybody ever have some flashbacks when you hear something just play, and you just be like, oh, I remember where I was the time I heard that? I mean, that's one of the reasons that, that it, 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 we struggle sometimes, amen, with those men. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to sing anything, I'm not going to introduce any lyrics, because I want y'all to make it in, but here's the thing. What I began to realize was that the music that I was listening to was preventing me from getting closer to God. Because when I would try to pray, I would start thinking some of those lyrics. I would start thinking some of those songs would start to play in my mind. And what would happen is it would get in the way of me getting closer to God. And I remember I would say, God, I want to grow, I want to grow, I want to grow. I keep falling. I don't have the strength that I need. And God's like, well, you're not talking to me. You're not praying. You're not getting any strength. And I realized, and what he, what he showed me was the music I was listening to was getting in the way. And he said to me, I want you to destroy it. Now, now I'm not telling you this is what you need to do, but this is what he told me. He said, you need to destroy it. Now, this is back in the day when we had, when we had mixtapes. Amen? Anybody remember the mixtapes? Come on. Now, I had some tapes on tapes on tapes. I had tapes for all different occasions. Where my, where my old school players at? Where my old school players now, if you still have your mixtape, you might not be delivered. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You might, I'm not calling you out. I'm just saying you might want to check your collection. But there was, there was a problem that I had because I had spent all of this time. And back in the day, you had to spend time to build those mixtapes because you had to wait till the quiet storm came on to get the right song at the right time. Come on. You had to catch it before the commercial came in and blend it. And when you got it right, oh, come on. That thing was set. Y'all don't know. They all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. And so when God said destroy it, I mean, I literally had like a hundred of these tapes, and I remember saying, God, what if I just give it to my brother? Because what I was, because when, because I was like, what if, if I just get it away, but how many know if I gave it to my brother, my brother, I would have told him later, it was just a loan and I want that back. <laughs> God said, no, you need to destroy it. And I remember having a, I remember wrestling with God over that thing. Like, like Jacob and the angel, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to let go of this thing right here. And, and I remember putting that in the trash and, 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 and letting it go and watching it go. And I remember having a defeat. But, but one of the things I realized was I said, God, as much as I want to listen to this music, I want you more. As much as I enjoy this, as much as it's connected to so many memories, as much as this, is, this has been a blessing to me personally, I just felt good. God, I don't want anything to get between me and you. And I remember the day I let that go, it was like something broke in my spirit. All of a sudden, there was a commitment that was made, and I was released to go on a whole nother level with God. My worship went to a whole nother level. All of a sudden, things became a whole lot more serious and real. I don't know what it is that you may be wrestling with, but there may be something that God is saying, listen, are you really wanting to go to the next level with me? Can you lay some things down? Are there things are there that you need to cut off? Amen. Uh, you know, uh, are there people in your life you need to cut off? 
My wife showed me a post on Facebook the other day. It said, um, don't be afraid to cut off anyone, and it was signed by Duke Power. <laughs> Somebody's going to get that a little bit later. But how many understand that in order for you to go where God has taken you, you got to be willing to let some stuff go? Tell your neighbor, let some stuff go. You see, you see Paul said, the way I'm going to help you with this particular area in giving he said in verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians 16, he said, on the first day of every week, put something aside. And Paul, because he had come, he had tried to get this, this offering. People were not ready. They weren't prepared. They hadn't put forth the discipline. Paul said, here's the way we're going to discipline. Every week, at the first of the week, put some aside. Now, first thing we need to know, first of all, is that Paul was saying, at the first of the week, you should do it. Because Paul realized that the end of the week, what, it might not be there. How many know, you know, some of us got some of these checks where we say we got more month than our money. We get to the end of the week, we find out there's a gap. That's because many times we've made all these decisions first. That at, at the end, we don't have room for what's left. But how many understand that God wants first in your life? God doesn't want sloppy seconds. God doesn't want you to take care of everything else and take care of him. God wants to come before Uncle Sam. How many know Uncle Sam knows better than to trust you to give him what you owe him? He gets it first. And then you get to manage what's left. You see, what it, when it comes to, 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 to discipline and, and, and making sure that we're doing the right things, how many know we got to put God first as well? That's why it's important for you to have a routine when you get up in the morning. How many, how many know that in the morning you should have a, a process that you go through, one, to give God the first part of your day? Because some of us, if we get too far down the day, the day to get hold it up before we talk to the Lord, we got something to say. We're going to speak in tongues and it's not going to be angelic. Come on, we go, come on, some of us are going to have some attitudes for the rest of the day. How many of you have a lot less stress in your life? You'd be able to deal with stuff a lot better if you, had a, if you gave God the first part of your day. You see, one of the things that I know about God and I love about God is when I get into his presence in the first thing, God will put stuff in my spirit that I don't even know what I need for for the rest of the day, but he knows what's coming. And God is like, I got to give you a little more grace because that coworker's coming. I mean, no, we don't know when the coworker's coming, but they're coming. Oh, come on. We don't, we don't know when that person's going to cut us off on the road, but it's happening. And come on, I got personalized tags. I can't act crazy. Come on, everybody know I'm a pastor. And so how I many know you got, to, you got to be ready, Amen. And, and so by giving God first, that, that helps us to, to, have to put, put into practice what we need to take us through the rest of the day. You see, when it comes to giving, we got to give God first. You see, we have to establish a habit. We got to renew our mind because you, the reality is the world is preying on the fact that you don't have a plan. How many, a lot of times we say, we don't have money. Oh, man, I don't have enough money. The problem is you pay too much attention to them sale emails that come into your email account. And every time, you know, you see this, oh, it's 50% off. What really trips me out is we weren't planning on spending money on nothing. But because it's 50% off, we won't buy three of them and talk about how much money we save. Come on, we're, come on how many know that don't make no sense? That don't make no sense. You know, and so, and so a lot of times, and the truth be told, if we were to be honest, some of us got closet stockpiled at all of them sales on all those deals that we made, stuff that we don't need. And then the truth, is it, the truth is, some of us spend money on stuff really because we just go over the top. Now, you needed a handbag, but did it need to be $350? I know I'm meddling right now. I moved from preaching and into meddling. Ariana, start my car. It's about to get rough in here. I'm just saying without a plan, you can't do what you need to do. And, and I would argue in here that, that everybody in here, I would say, how, how many people love God? How many people say you love God? Come on. Amen. You're in church. That's okay. Amen. And I believe that. I believe we do. And I believe that if I would ask you how many people want to honor God and want to trust Him and everything else, we would raise our hand. But when it comes down to our finances, we say, well, God, I don't have enough. But the fact is, what we're saying is, God, I've honored all these things ahead of you. We love Him, but do we love Him enough to give Him first? We, we, we want to bless Him, but do we want to bless Him enough to do it? Paul said, every week, put a little bit aside. Every week, I want you to establish some discipline of putting God first at the first part of the week. So when it comes time to give, you won't have to wrestle. You won't have to fight. Paul was saying, I want you to establish a habit. How many know that habits will impact your life? You see, we see we all have habits. Some of our habits are not good habits. Some of our habits will hurt us. I remember when I, my first job out of college, I was, I was living in Greensboro, North Carolina. I, I worked in Asheboro, North Carolina. So I had a 45-minute drive. 
I worked in a manufacturing plant. I worked first shift that started at 7 a.m. And I remember I was having a hard time because especially when I just first got out of school, I mean, I was one of those students that when I got my transcript, if I had a class that started before 10 a.m., I immediately rescheduled it because I'm like, I don't do daylight like that. I don't get up that early. And I remember I used to hang out late and get up early in the morning. And when I started working, it changed my life because I was having a hard time getting there at 7 o'clock. I would get there at 715, 730. 7.45, 7.45, I'm going to be honest, every now and again. And I remember one time, this, this, this changed my life. My boss called a meeting with everybody. He said, let me explain something to everybody in here. Your job requires you to be here at 7 o'clock. And in fact, because your first shift, you really need to be here at 6.45 to talk to night shift. If you can't make it here at 6.45, you cannot work here. And do what you, he's like, I don't care what you got to do, do what you got to do, but this is required, and I really don't feel like I should have to tell grown people what time they have to be at work. And walked out the room. How many know my life was changed at that point? Because I said to myself, I know he was talking about me. How many know you know when people talk about you, right? I ain't going to call anybody out. I'm just talking to everybody. But I was the latest one in there. And I said to myself, I'm about to lose my job because I don't have enough discipline to get up in the morning. So I got three alarm clocks. I got one by the bed. I got one over by the, by the closet and one over there by the shower. Anybody know? Anybody understand how, what, I'm, what I'm doing here? I, I, did, I did all of that. I got up earlier and early. I gave myself an hour early. But I was still struggling because I had a really bad habit. I didn't realize the reason I was struggling because I was going to sleep at midnight and 1 o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to get up at 5 o'clock if you're going to sleep at midnight and 1 o'clock in the morning. And what I realized was because I had just gotten to the habit of watching some of the dumbest, doing dumb stuff, just watching TV that I, could, that I could record and see later. I was about to lose my job over television shows. How many know that when we have bad habits, many times they can destroy your life? You, some of us have some bad habits that the truth be told, if we're not careful, if we allow our habits to continue, they will take us out simply because we haven't taken the time to put discipline into our lives. You see, you see, one of the things that I realized was that habits can destroy you, but then also habits can also help you. How many know that all your habits don't have to be bad habits? Every habit doesn't have to be you just smoking weed and drinking, amen? There, there can be some good habits that you can establish in your life. One of the things that I had to realize was in order for me to do what I needed to do, I had to put systems in place to make sure I was doing the right thing over and over and over automatically. That's why I had a plan for when I got up in the morning. I had to set a time for when I went to sleep at night. How many know that with your, with your finances, you got to put a plan of what you're going to do when you get it? So before you get it, you already have a plan. Now, some of us already have a plan, but it's not a good one. Some of us have not just spent our money from this check, but we spent money on the next check. Come on, we done, we done borrowed. Come on, the payday man, loan man knows us. Come on, the pawn shop already knows we're coming. Because many times we've, got, we've established habits of we don't have a plan that's, that's going to do the right thing. But how many know establishing good habits can help you? So one of the habits I had to establish was I had to stay out of the mall. How many know the mall is designed to defeat you? Come on, the mall is designed. Come on, there are people that spend all of their time studying the right light to put on stuff, the right music to play. Don't you know they spray scents to make you feel good and make you want to just give up some money? So when you walk in and you be like, wow, that dress is really talking to you. Yes, it's talking to you. And if you really listen, what it's saying is, run! Get out of there as fast as you can. The deck is, the deck is stacked against you. And by the way, if you already have 65 of those dresses, but you don't have that shade, how many of you might be already, or you might have enough? You see, you see here's the problem that we have. We got to structure things. We got to put things around us to help us to do what we need to do. You see, one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things that I've noticed too, by the way, is when it, when it comes to habits, we can establish some good habits in a lot of different areas. A lot of us, it's, it, when we get saved, some of us, you know, we've been living, you know, in the world, doing other things, and God gets a hold of our life. He changes us, and we can come to church, and, and we can establish a habit of going to church, and thank God for that. Amen? How many of you ought to have a habit of going to church? How many know church is a good thing? Amen? We, we can make a habit even of, of worship, and, and how many know worship is a good thing? Amen? You, we can make a habit of serving. Serving is a good thing. You gotta, if you want to grow, you got to use your gift. These are things we should do. We can do all of these great things, but one of the last, one of the hardest, one of the most difficult things we can do is get, our habit, get into a habit of giving. I saw a cartoon one time that said it all. This guy was getting baptized, and before he went down, he said, hold on one second. He pulled out his wallet, held his, his wallet up as he went down in the water. And basically, he was saying, God, you can have everything else, but I got to hold on to what's right in here. 
And the reality is, it seems like when it comes to our finances, that's one of the biggest strongholds that we tend to have. Because we say, God, I love you, I trust you, and everything else. But when you say 10% of, the, of my income, you have crossed the line. Now you're getting too crazy. But how many understand that when Jesus died on the cross, there was nothing too much that he wasn't willing to give? That's why he gave his life. And, how many, and, and I, what I've come to, when I've done the math, 10%, I'm still getting a steal, amen, because I got eternal life. Come on, I got peace that passes all understanding. When I look at what everything God has given me, anything he asks is, is nothing in comparison. You see, we got to trust him, amen? You see, consequently, one of the things that, I, that, I, that I've learned over the years is that, by the way, we not make, need to make a habit of giving. That's why one of the things we do is we offer automated giving. One of the things that I've done is I've said, listen, if, if Uncle Sam can get his before I see it, I mean, I want God to get it before even Uncle Sam gets it, amen? I want God to get it, and so I've set it up automatically. That way, if I'm on vacation, if something happens, it doesn't matter. God is taken care of because God has been too good to me. God has blessed me too much. And, and by the way, I, I have a hard time saying, God, I love you so much in every area, but except in this area of my life. I say, God, I, I don't want that kind of blockage in my relationship with the Lord. You see, one of the things that, one of the things that we've done is, is we've established a system that can help you to establish good habits. Not only that, but, but when we do this, I believe it allows us to actually see things at a different perspective. Look at this. In, in verse, um, Paul says in verse number two, he says, first of all, set at, at the first of the week, set some money aside, right, in keeping with your income. Now, now first of all, in, when he says in keeping with your income in the NIV, in the King James, it talks about, it says, as he may prosper. If you look at the actual Greek that's used here, that word deals with prosperity. You see, one of the things that we have to recognize is that we are prosperous. How many know that everybody in here is prosperous? If you live, I know you say, listen, I don't have enough money and I don't have this and I got a hoopty and everything else. Come on, if you got a hoopty, how many know you're more prosperous than most people in the world? Come on, you got clean water, amen? You got a roof. Come on, how many know you got food to eat? Nobody's missing meals in here, amen? You're prosperous, amen? You see, the reality is we, 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 we don't think we're prosperous because we're looking at what somebody else has. And anytime you're looking at somebody else's SL 450, you're going to feel bad about your hoopty, amen? But if, you, but if you realize that God has blessed you and you recognize that everything you have, by the way, is a product of grace, God has blessed you not because of what you've done, but in spite of what you've done. All you can do is say, God, thank you for everything you've done for me. You, you see, what we have to understand is that we are prosperous. And, and when we think about prosperity, sometimes I, I, I feel bad talking about this because the church has kind of gone a little too far with prosperity. And I say, I say we're prosperous, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to get a, 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 their own private jet to fly around the country. I mean, prosperity when we have, and, and, and even when the Bible talks about wealth, well, the wealth in the, in the Old Testament, Khalil, it, it talks about a means. And when you talk about somebody that's wealthy, you talk about a person who has means. We all have means, amen? The, the challenge is we use those means for different reasons. Now, some of us use our means to put rims on our ride. But, but how many know you, you can use those means also to do what God has called you to do, to be a blessing? You see, we make all sorts of choices throughout, and when we deal with what we have, if you can put things aside, it takes discipline. It, it takes a wealthy-minded person to say, I'm not going to spend everything I have, but I'm going to put something to the side. How many know you'd have a whole lot less stress in your life if you had some money in the bank? Amen? How many know you'd have a lot less your, your anxiety? You could save money, amen, on stress pills, amen, with a little bit of extra in the bank. How many know that's a practical tip right there? But the challenge we have is we got to look at things differently. I remember there was a time when I, when I, when I first started working, I, it, I could not hold on to a dollar to save my life. It seems like as soon as I had, I had to spend it somewhere. I had, it seemed like wherever, wherever time I got paid, I just had to spend money. Anybody ever had that problem in life? And, and what I learned was all I was doing was I was putting myself into a hole. And I was causing more drama and stress in my life. And one of the things in, in actually setting aside money to bless God with is it forced discipline in my life to say, listen, I don't have to be subject to every sale and every whim and every emotional impulse that hits my life, but I can have discipline to be who God has called me to be. You see, one of the things that, that the Bible says is that, um, that, that, that he says in, in verse 2 is that we, we've been prosperous. He says in keeping with your income and, and how you've been blessed. How many know we should expect to be productive? 
We should expect to produce as saints of God. We should expect for God to continue to prosper us as we, as we align our thinking with his. Not only that, but he says, I want you to set aside a portion. That word set aside in the Greek, it, it actually at the root talks about ordain. It talks about how, you know, how many know that we've all been ordained by God? God has set a plan for us. God has a purpose for us. Before we were born, God said to Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, I knew your name, and I had a purpose for you. You see, when it comes to our finances, we should have a purpose and we should have a plan before it even comes to us, amen? We should be ordaining that. Why? Because we should be thinking like our Father does. We should be thinking as king's kids, recognizing that when God blesses us, we understand that the the job that we work is not our source. It's just the means that God is using. But how many know God can cause you to be blessed from any source that he wants to be blessed? You You see, when we recognize that God is the true source, we don't get so stressed out over over the one source that we've been looking at. Amen? And we can honor him and we can keep him first. You see, I believe that this is what happened. Paul said, I want you to do this. I want you to get into this habit. I want you to have this vision for what's coming into your hands so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul said, I'm coming back, and when I do, I want you to be ready. How many know God wants us to be ready? How many know Jesus is coming back? Amen. And by the way, I want to be ready when he comes back. I I want to be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. I want to be able to know that when I stand before God with integrity, I I will know that I know that I'm going to spend eternity with him. You see, the challenge that we have is until we actually put forth some habits, until we put some discipline in our lives, not just in our giving, but also in our prayer, also in study, also in our worship, until we start to put that in place, we're not going to have the character that we need to continue to grow in God. And the fact is it starts with us establishing good habits. Come on, I want to pray with us today. And I want to encourage us to to prepare to live on the next level of our lives in every area. We specifically were talking about giving, but this principle applies to everything. One of the things that I've discovered is if we can get this established in our finances, we can get this this principle established in every other area of our lives. You see, the, the fact is I can't see how you pray. I don't know if you've been reading your Bible, but I can see what you give. And giving is, is it's a quantitative way to demonstrate our commitment to God. Because when we give, we understand that when you give, it's not a matter of you just giving to a church. How many know that the church does operate on your finances? So, so, so don't get me wrong. If you don't give, if you didn't give anything, the church would not be able to do what it does. But, but one of the things that I learned early on, my mom told me, is that it's not about what the church does. It's about your relationship with God and trusting him. And the church is just an intermediary for how we, we actually can, can show our love to God. And the thing I need you to understand is that when you give, what you're saying is, God, number one, I prioritize you. Number two, I trust you. Number three, I love you. And I believe that's our, the desire of each and every one's person's here in your heart. I believe that you, you, you love God. I believe that you want to prioritize God. One of, the, one of the ways we can demonstrate that is with our giving. Come on, let's stand on this morning. And as we stand, I want to pray with us, and I want to encourage us. Um, we, we here at the Higher Purpose Church, we've established a number of challenges over the year, uh, over the years. One of those challenges is the tithe challenge. Now, with the tithe challenge, we, we, we actually offer you an opportunity to test God. There's one area in Scripture that God says, you can test me in, and that's in giving. In Malachi chapter 3. He, he said, test me and see if I will not throw open the windows of blessing and pour, throw open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so much that there won't be room enough to receive. You see, God basically tells us that if we trust him with the tithe, if we give him 10%, if we trust him in advance and give him 10% off the top of our income, he says, test me and see if I won't bless you. So as a ministry, we've just said what God says. We want to give you the tithe challenge. We want you to test God for three months. And I want you to, here's what I want you to do. I want you to to, to give if maybe you haven't been tithing. I want you to track what takes place. And if God does not bless you, keep a record of everything that happens. Let us know. We'll reimburse you your money. Why? Because we believe, we believe God that much. How many people believe God? You see, now, now, here's the thing. If you want to take the tithe challenge, the one thing I want you to do is take out your cell phone and text the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, to our text number. If you text that it'll get you into the information we'll we'll share with you we'll encourage you over the next three months 
I will send scriptures, we'll send reinforcements to kind of help you to stay on track. We'll walk you through how to set things up. But one of the things that we want to do is, I believe, give you that opportunity to test God because what we're looking for is a testimony. In fact, when, when God does bless, when God does open doors, we want you to share that with us so we can share that with others because we know we overcome not just by the blood of the Lamb but by the word of our testimony. Somebody else is going to want to hear how God has blessed your life. So I want to encourage us today to keep God first. And as we pray, I want you to take a minute and talk to the Lord where you are. I want to take a minute and allow you to allow God to show you. Maybe there's areas in your life, maybe it's even beyond giving. Maybe you've been tithing and you've been giving an offering. Maybe it's other areas where God is saying, listen, I want you to establish some discipline in your life, some consistency, some habits that can build you. Come on, as we pray, I want you to talk to the Lord. Fathers, we come before you right now. We thank you once again for life, health, and strength. Thank you for the blessings that you've provided. Thank you for the ways that you've made, doors that you've opened. Thank you, God, for the grace that you've shown us in our lives. And Father, as we stand before you on today, God, I pray that we would trust you, God, financially. God, in every person, every household in this house, God, if we've struggled in this area, if we've resisted in this area, God, we submit to you right now. God, even as we continue to go forward, help us to, to do what we need to do to honor you, to put you first. God, to allow you, God, to take your rightful place. Allow us, oh God, to say thank you and, and express our love for you, God, even as how you've blessed us. And Lord, we say thank you right now. God, we give you glory right now. And we give you praise right now for what you're doing. In the name of Jesus.